the most decisive factor in your practice is the honesty that you bring to each breath, each moment you make a decision. The question often comes up, is it possible in, say, in a layperson's life, to go far in the practice? You know, although a monk's life has a lot of advantages, just the fact that a person is a monk or a layperson is not the decisive factor. The decisive factor is how much honesty you bring to the practice each time you make a decision, each time some issue comes up in the mind. Otherwise, opportunities for developing skillful habits get lost, and opportunities for stopping unskillful ones get wasted. We're working on a skill here, and it's important to re remember that each time you reinforce the skill, it's that much closer to awakening. Each time you give in to an unskillful impulse, it's that much further away. So keep emphasizing the, the importance of the decisions you're making right now, right now. The skills here are the skills of a warrior. Sometimes the Buddha would illustrate the skills of meditation with the skills, say, of a, a musician a cook, someone in a relatively peaceful place. But other times he would, he would make comparisons with skills of warriors, the skills you have to develop in battle, where there are definite dangers. You are facing enemies, and how do you skillfully sidestep them? How do you skillfully defeat them? And part of it lies in recognizing which thought patterns in the mind are unskillful, which ones really are your enemy, in the sense that they're, they work to your long-term suffering, your long-term harm. The problem is they speak with your voice. It sounds like you in your brain, saying, how about this, how about that? doesn't matter, just one more time. That's an important argument you've got to learn how to counter. Just one more time. Doesn't matter. Because it applies also when the unskillful voices are trying to deride your, de your determination to at least make one skillful decision. They keep saying, well, you can go ahead and try to thwart us right now, but a few minutes down the line you're going to get into us, so why not give into us now? And your response is to be, I don't know if I'm going to be here in a couple minutes. I'd like to die in the midst of a skillful decision rather than an unskillful one. Each effort to do something skillful does count, just as each surrender to an unskillful decision. That counts as well. So treat each moment as important. And don't let the belittling voices of your unskillful mind states get you down. Don't let them thwart you. Don't let them discourage you. Because this is all we have, is our decisions made moment by moment. And the more consistently you can stick with the skillful ones, the better. The more quickly you can Or an unskillful mind state that's on a roll, the better. Even if you can't totally block it, the fact that you're trying to fight it is important. If you just give in, the John Mahabua used to say, how can you even say that you lose? You're not even fighting.
losing is better than not fighting at all. At least you put up an effort. Maybe there's a scrap of insight that comes from that particular effort. And over time those little scraps can build up. You begin to see patterns. You begin to see around a lot of the subterfuges that your unskillful mind seeks to have used in order to maintain control in the mind. And you can begin to affect a revolution. You can overthrow them. Of course, the most important thing is that you don't identify with them. Just because a thought happens to come into your mind doesn't mean it's your thought. You don't have to lay claim to it. You don't have to believe it. This is one of the most important lessons you need in gaining powers of concentration. You've made up your mind. You're going to stay with the breath, stay with whatever your meditation object is. And you've got to maintain that intention, stick with that intention. So the rule while you're meditating is anything else that comes up is inappropriate, out of place. And of course, other voices will come in, other intentions will come in. You simply have to regard them not as your ideas, but simply as distractions. An effective way of not getting distracted is simply not to identify with them. It's like somebody else speaking outside while you're meditating. You don't have to identify with what they're saying. You don't have to take it in. You're not responsible for it. And when you learn to ignore it, to pay it no attention, it's like a bullet that seem to be aimed at your heart, but suddenly just falls down to the ground. So there are times when it's affected to see this practice as a, as a kind of a battlefield, with skillful and unskillful desires battling it out. And that you've got to learn the skills of a warrior. Remember, a warrior knows how to choose his battles or her battles. When you're in the position to choose them, sometimes they get forced on you and you have to fight no matter what. But if you are in the position to choose your battles, choose the ones that you know you have at least some chance of winning. So it gives you a sense of confidence. And also choose ones where winning out does make a difference. It's also wise to have a place to back off when you find that you can't battle whatever the issue is. This is why developing powers of concentration is so important. It gives you a place to retreat to. when an issue really seems to be screaming in your ears, and you know it's not skillful, and you can't see your way around it, say, I'm just not going to go there at all. I'm not going to get involved. If the issue is stubborn, you can be stubborn too. Go back to your breath. Stay with the physicality of your present moment, because you know that if you start getting into the word word battles, you're going to lose yourself. So hunker down and realize that a lot of times the tension over a particular issue is going to get reflected in the breath. So at the very least, you can work with the breath. This is an important point. Independent core arising. The breath comes right after ignorance. This is the kind of breath that leads to suffering. It's one of the forms of fabrication, bodily fabrication. And it's one of the basic building blocks of all, building blocks of all your emotions. 
There's the bodily fabrication. There's verbal fabrication, which is directed thought and evaluation, the conversations you have inside. And then there's feeling and perception. Those are the building blocks of your emotions, the building blocks from which your desires are formed. So if you see an unskillful desire coming in and seeming to take control, you can get back down to the breath, work through whatever tension, whatever tightness may be surrounding that desire. And that helps to weaken it. And you're also working on a different perception. Instead of seeing the tension as this power that comes along with the desire, that's proof of the desire's insistence, you begin to see as something that you can change. You work at it, not by arguing with the desire, but changing the energy configuration in the body. This is why that factor of mental fabrication is so important, your feelings and your perceptions. When we practice breath meditation, we're learning ways of dealing with perception, ways of dealing with feeling. Breathe in a way that gives rise to ease fullness, rapture. Learn to perceive the breath as a whole body process. How do you perceive the breath energy in the body in such a way that it can calm down the movements of the in and out breath? And start perceiving breath as energy filling the whole body. When you read up on the ways that John Lee describes the different levels of breath energy, that can change your perception of what breath is, what breath can be, what kind of breath you can tune into. That too can help undercut an unskillful emotion, help provide a foundation for a skillful one. As you breathe in ways that give rise to more ease, you perceive the breath as the shadow side of the conversation going on in your mind. And so you change the shadows, and that's going to change the conversation. In other words, you're trying to bring knowledge to processes that are normally done in ignorance. You try to bring your head and your heart together. The Buddha never made a clear distinction between head and heart. The word jitta covers both sides of the mind, the emotional and the intellectual. This is what we're doing. We're training both the head and the heart. the breath as well. The head is the part that can figure out causality, figure out relationships. So your emotions turn from emotions that are harmful into skillful ones. We all want happiness. That's the basic movement of the heart. And what we're doing as we meditate is to teach the head respect for that desire for happiness, realizing that this is the big issue in life, the question of happiness, the question of suffering. This helps keep your mind from wandering off and speculating about other things that are not related to that issue. At the same time, your heart needs to learn respect for cause and effect. What's going to work and bring out about happiness? I mean, the heart wants things right now, right now, right now. And the head has to tell you, no, the causes have to be put in place. So just as the head has taught respect for the issue of happiness and suffering, your heart has to learn respect for experience and causality. When the two of them work together, when they both have re this proper kind of respect, then you start getting results. When they're working as allies like this, then the, the fight against unskillful emotions, unskillful thoughts, impulses, desires gets a lot easier. And this is another important warrior skill, learning who your allies are, learning how to bind them together, make them loyal to one another. So it's important on the one hand that you take the time to 
gain an intellectual understanding of what you're doing, because it can help illuminate what's going on in the mind, in this battle between what's skillful and unskillful, your skillful habits, your unskillful habits, learning to recognize which is which, what they're made of, so you can take apart the building blocks of unskillful habits and reassemble them as skillful ones. And both the head and the heart are working together in the battle. It gets a lot easier. The question of learning how to be honest is a lot easier as well. Because you find that the head and the heart are on the same page. There's less of that tendency to lie to yourself. And all the issues that come up in the mind get a lot clearer. As you bring more understanding to the process of what's really important in life, the decisions you're making right now.